Good morning, church. It's so good to be here to welcome the Holy Spirit, to lift up our voices to Him. Let's sing out. We love you, Jesus. We believe in your power and we welcome you, God. Let's sing this. I think the stone's getting ready to roll.
you come into the room, the atmosphere changes. Church, he is here this morning. Open your hearts.
worship the King of Kings.
this bride sounds beautiful. We're going to sing, You Are Holy, just, just the church sing that, amen. You are holy. We are so glad you're joining us. Whether you're with us online or in person, here are a few things you need to know. There are a lot of great things happening at Harvest Time. Here are a few ways you can get involved right now. To check out all things that are going on, scan the QR code or visit hdchurch.com. If you'd like to give, you can visit us at hdchurch.com, click on Give at the top of the page, or use our Realm Connect app to set up reoccurring giving, or give at any time using the Harvest Time offering envelopes. We have so many opportunities to believe, belong, and be light. For more information on all things Harvest Time, meet us at the Connect Desk. We love you, Harvest Time, and have an amazing week. Bye. Howdy, Harvest Time. I want to invite you to come to our annual Harvest Party on Sunday, October 30th, between 4 and 7 p.m., right here at HTC. This is a family event where we can celebrate together the blessings of being part of this HTC family and the harvest season. There'll be games and crafts, food and square dancing, hay rides, lots of fun. You don't need to be a kid to come, but you need to be young at heart. Yeehaw! Yeehaw! <laughs> we end the night with a trunk of treats for our children. If you're interested in hosting a trunk or helping out in any way, please scan the QR code on the screen or in your bulletin. When you come, please bring some cookies and cupcakes for our sweets table to share. So harvest time, Grab your cowboy boots and your hats, bring some friends, and get ready to dance. See you there. God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Harvest Time Church. How many of you know it's a good day to be together worshiping the Lord? It's a beautiful fall day. Didn't, didn't our worship team do a great job leading us this morning? We're so glad that you've come today. We want to welcome everybody that's worshiping with us online at this 1030 service. We're so glad that you're here worshiping the Lord with us. A couple of things coming up. How many of you have been to a harvest party at Harvest Time Church? It's been, because of the pandemic, it's been a couple of years since we've done, who's been to a harvest party? So we have a great time. It's gonna be outdoors the last Sunday 
of October, late in the afternoon. We have a square dance caller, uh, hay rides for the kids. We have good food. Um, we do need some help. At the end of the night, we want to fill some car trunks uh, with candy and have a trunks trunks of treats for the kids. And so if you're willing to, uh, some people like to decorate, there, there may or may not be a prize for the best decorated trunk, but some people like to decorate their trunks and uh, just put some candy in some baskets and the kids are gonna go up and down. And so if you're willing to uh, use, donate your trunk and uh, bring some treats, you can scan the QR code in the bottom corner of the bulletin and uh, you can be part of that. Also, missions on Saturday, the 5th of November, we're gonna be packing food for Ukrainian refugees and uh, everything's gonna be provided probably about two, two and a half hours on a Saturday morning on November 5th. And if you'd like to sign up to help, we need at least 100 volunteers. And so uh, if you'll scan the QR code in the bottom right-hand corner of your bulletin, uh, you can sign up to be part of that. We wanna thank you for honoring the Lord with your giving today. We wanna thank you for your loving financial support of Harvest Time Church. Uh, the Lord says in his word, bring the whole tithe into my house so that there might be food in my house. Only place in the Bible. God says, test me in this and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessing upon you. You can use the offering envelope to give today. You can use the envelope to give by credit card or debit card if you like. If you are giving that way, please remember to complete the three-digit code that um, in the place that's provided on the envelope. Uh, that way, Ethel, our bookkeeper, doesn't have to chase you down for that three-digit code during the week this coming week. If you're giving by cash, you like credit for that, just slip your cash in the offering envelope, write your information on the outside, or you can slip a check in the offering envelope. Some people like to give by text. The information for that is on the screens behind me. You can make a gift to Harvest Time Church anytime online at htchurch.com. Just click on the giving link on the top of our homepage and it will guide you in making a secure gift online. I'm gonna ask the ushers if they would come to wait on us. Moses wrote this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, don't say to yourself that my cleverness and my hard work has gained this wealth for me. Remember the Lord your God. He is the one who gives you the ability to get wealth. If you've done well, it's because God has given you the ability to do well. If you've worked hard, it was God who gave you the opportunity to work hard and the capacity to work hard. If you've been clever with your money, Give thanks to the Lord. He's the one who made you clever. He made lots of people not clever. So if he made you clever, you can be thankful to the Lord for that. And uh, remember the Lord your God. And we pray that he richly blesses you as you give back to him. Let's give thanks. Father, thank you that you lavished your very best on us in Jesus. You didn't withhold the best you had. You offered him up for us freely. Freely we've received so freely we give back to you today with glad and sincere hearts, tithes, offerings, missions giving, building fund giving. Father, bless these loaves and fishes. Cause them to be more than enough to meet the need of this, your house, and the work of your kingdom all around the world. Bless every giver in this offering today. Open the windows of heaven, just like you promised you would do. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. God bless you while you give. Hi, Harvest Time. I'd like to invite you to a private screening of a new film, Jesus Revolution. It's the true story of a national spiritual awakening in the early 1970s and its origins within the community of teenage hippies in Southern California. Now, Lionsgate Film challenged us that we couldn't fill theaters in the Northeast. I'd like to challenge you. Let's rise up, let's stand up, let's take to the streets and who doesn't like a night out at the movies for free? Come on Tuesday night, October 18th at 7 p.m. at the Stamford Landmark AMC Theater. It's imperative that you RSVP for this private screening. Please scan the QR code on the screen or visit htchurch.com. We'll see you at the movies. We hope you'll join us Tuesday evening for this screening of the Jesus Revolution. 
in your program, there is a QR code. There's an insert with a QR code. You can scan that to reserve free tickets. How many of you remember the charismatic outpouring of the late 60s and the early 1970s? I was just a kid, but my family got saved in that outpouring. And um, come see the story of that on Tuesday evening. Um, I think it's important to know what God did because I believe that God's going to do it again. And I believe it's going to be in greater measure. I believe it's going to be in greater measure. Ruth Ann, I was saved in revival, and I believe before God calls me home, I'm going to see it again. I believe we're going to see a great revival sweep across our country. It's critical. I'm, I'm preaching. I'm not supposed to be preaching. It's, <laughs> it's critical. Situation is critical, but it's not too late. It's not too late. One revival, one revival can turn this whole thing around. So... Pray for that with us. I want to ask Libna Diaz, uh, uh, Gosselin, and uh, Joanne Caraprisi to come if they would very quickly. Would you welcome Libna and would you welcome Joanne while they come? So we are, we are super, come Libna if you would, we're, we're super, super excited to let you know about two opportunities uh, that are new for us. First of all, Kids Choir. Uh, Libna is going to be leading Kids Choir, and they're going to be getting together music for Christmas. Now, we tried this once, we tried this twice, and because of COVID, we had to, we had to cancel two times, but the third time's a charm, and uh, we're believing. So, Libna, would you just tell everybody about Kids Choir? Good morning. The Apostle Paul encourages Timothy to stir up the gift of God, and that is what we are doing with our kids. We are going for a full-on Christmas musical, um, and we are encouraging children in grades kindergarten through fifth grade to join the choir. We are rehearsing every Sunday from now through December 4th, 9.15 to 10.15 a.m. So if you have friends, family members, uh, neighbors, please invite them out to join. We had 36 this morning, which was awesome, but we want more. The more, the merrier. Um, and we are looking to uh, also include middle and high schoolers with choreography, cast, um, and we are going to be doing this, putting this on December 9th, the weekend of December 9th. Thank you so much. And Lib, if people want to get involved with Kids Choir, how can they do that? QR code or scan the QR code in the bottom right corner, or you can see Libna out in the foyer at the end of the service. Thank you, Lib. Joanne, come if you would, please. So um, Joanne, many of you know Joanne has led our Good Friday Choir across a number of years. Joanne recently retired from teaching music for New York City public schools, and she has extensive uh, choir directing. Were you in the suburbs? Were you in the city? Or you were in both. West, in, both in, in New York City and in Westchester? And um, so we have asked Joanne now that, now, you know, the Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to use you and not pay you. So now that, <laughs> now, now that, now that Joanne is retired, we have asked her to be our full-time choir director and put together a sanctuary choir for Harvest Time that runs all through the year. And so, Joanne, do you want to just tell us about choir? First, I want to say thank you, Pastor, for this wonderful opportunity. And as we learned in our women's conference yesterday, when the Lord knocks and the Lord is tugging on your heart and wants you to serve, uh, you better say yes, because that opportunity may not come again. <laughs> so I really feel honored, you know, at this stage of my life, retired, that I can still serve the Lord with the ministry of the choir, and um, that's really my heart. I, I love the choir. But anyway, this Thursday begins our rehearsals um, in the music room, 7 p.m. sharp. If you've been a part of our Good Friday Choir or part of the worship team, just come at 7, and uh, if you'd like to be part of the choir, uh, you'll have to sing for me, so come at 6.30. And we'll, you know, it's, it'll be a great time together of learning, praising the Lord, and uh, having some fun. God bless you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you so much, Libna. Uh, just want to say a very warm welcome to our friend Ruth Ann Garlock, who is with us. She was with our ladies yesterday. 
How many ladies were part of that wonderful uh, opportunity yesterday? And uh, Ruth Ann prayed over every woman that attended, uh, over 100 ladies that were uh, participated yesterday. Thank you, Ruth Ann. Uh, she is a teacher, she is an author, and a prayer warrior. And Judy is traveling with her. Judy and her husband pastor a uh, church in it's Canyon Lake. Canyon Lake. I wanted to say Canyon Creek. Canyon Lake, Texas. Judy and Ruth Ann, thank you so much for being with us today. I want to invite my friends uh, CS and Faith Robinson to come join me. We are super blessed today. Uh, CS and Faith are missionaries to college students in the city of Boston, Massachusetts. Um, the Lord called them uh, two years ago, because he loved them so much, they were, in, he's, uh, CS is going to share a word about comfort, so they were extremely comfor comfortable in Texas, uh, at home ministering in a church there, the Lord was really blessing their ministry, and because God loves them so much, he called them from Houston, Texas, to the winters of Boston, Massachusetts, and, uh, but they're there overseeing campus ministry uh, for um, 35 different colleges in the city of Boston. CS is going to tell us a lot more about that. Um, I do want to let you know, I, I forgot to do this in the first service. At the end of the service today, they're missionaries. They are raising support for the work. So here's the beautiful thing. When God calls you to mission work, not only do you have to give everything up and say yes, but then you have to raise your own support to go do the missions work. And so they're raising support, and we're going to have a chance to share in an offering and bless them at the end. But um, I want you to give a very, very warm welcome for our friends. Would you stand and give a very warm welcome? And then I'm just going to hand it to you guys and let you take it away. Give a warm welcome for CS and for Faith. Good morning, church. It's an honor to be here worshiping with you this morning. We have had a blast the last couple of years getting to know New England, learning what snow is and how to live in it. Um, we're honored that the Lord called us a few years ago from this small Texas town called Huntsville. It's just north of Houston, where we had been serving for a number of years with Chi Alpha and seeing just generations of students, one to the Lord, and um, disciple, becoming disciple makers, um, going into different realms in the marketplace, into campus ministry, church ministry, and to the ends of the, and to the, ends of the world. Um, and that was what we were part of. Um, our family, we have three small uh, children. They're eight, six, and four, three daughters. They're back with the kids today. And um, so we moved from this uh, rural town to the city of Boston. And um, it's amazing how, you know, I, I was in Huntsville. I did my undergrad there. Um, it was just about 20 years, and the Lord transplanted us. And um, I was just so amazed how the Lord lifted one burden from one place and then put a new burden in our heart for a completely different place. And so we've just see, been able to just see what God is already beginning to do and, and so honored to be a part of the work in Boston. Thank you for having us this morning. Awesome, thank you. All right, okay, you can hear me. Hey, good morning. I don't know what a church you guys are part of. I just heard you're gonna have party coming, harvest festival, new choir coming up. I mean, this is a party house. <laughs> this is great. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor, for having us, and what an honor to be here. Um, I was telling the pastor, I'm so grateful for you, and the pastor said, well, he has a great church. Uh, and the uh, pastor loves you, so I'm just grateful to be in a, such a setting to be here today. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for being here today. As my wife said, we are Chi Alpha Missionaries. It is an Assemblies of God campus ministry to the university campuses um, in the city of Boston. My wife and I moved to Boston about two years ago. And uh, if you know anything about the city of Boston, there are 252,000 students 35 mile, 35 universities in five mile radius. That's a lot of students, right? That's a lot of students. So, but the awesome thing is that God loves each one of them. He made them in their image, in His image. God loves them. 
right? They are his children that he paid, his blood. He made them first and then he redeemed them with his blood. So there are so many out there. My wife and I are extremely privileged to be uh, part of a ministry there, uh, serving Chi Alpha in the city. I would like to share a story. It was years ago. I was, uh, we were back in Texas still serving as campus pastors, in a, uh, campus missionaries in a university called Sam Houston State University. I remember several years ago, I was, one morning I was walking on campus and praying. I met this guy named Johnny. Johnny moved to America three, just three days before that, and he was sitting on a bench right in front of International Student Building. And uh, as I was say, hey man, you're sitting alone, can I come sit with you? Do you have a few minutes? And he said, yeah, of course I have time. And he said he was waiting for the friends that he met the day before, and they were supposed to be going to Walmart together, but those guys did not show up. Like, hey, I'm here. Let's go to Walmart. So we went to Walmart. We got him a bike. He wanted to get a bike so he could commute from his dorm to class and back. So we did that. After a couple of hours, I dropped him off at the dorm, and he said, see us, I had a great time. Can we have breakfast in the morning tomorrow? Wow, for a campus ministry, this is like, yeah, man. We have breakfast, lunch, dinner, and repeat. We can do this every day. So my wife made us all a good breakfast next day, and that grew into friendship and eventually started to come around a small group and into a large group. And this is Johnny. He would come to our Chi Alpha service, about, about 800 students there. He would sit on the back row, and he just takes a rest in the law. He just falls asleep for 45 minutes. I was like, man, this is embarrassing. Why don't you not come, you know? But secretly, I was happy that he was there. Then that turned and eventually, after seven months, I had the privilege to see him walk in the aisle of the church down the aisle and then giving his life to Jesus. It took seven months. Johnny gave the life to Jesus. And a few years after that, he went to London to do his master's. And then after that, he went back to Taiwan uh, to serve in his country, to be part of a business there. But years after that, I got a phone call from him. Hey, CS, I wanted to come to Taiwan to do my wedding. Well, I found this girl. She loves the Lord. She plays piano. She's from China. You know, I want to get married to her. Would you come to the wedding? So I had the opportunity to travel there and do his wedding in Taipei. I was there for six days. And after fifth day, I was about to leave. And he said, well, I don't think I mentioned you this. My mom and my brother started to go into church with me. What I'm saying is that university campuses are the most strategic mission field. If you want to reach the world, reach the university campuses. So students, we think that, you know, university campuses, man, these kids are like just doing water. With everything that's going on, with everything that they're experimenting, there is a real openness that they have. They are searching. They are searching, they are searching. You know, the, the findings of their parents will not meet the needs of their searching. So they are searching themselves. We need to create a space for them to search well. And if there are people can come around them, come alongside with them and help them walk their life. And I will tell you, and just like Pastor said, the next revival has to happen on a university campuses. Think of, is there any other place in America like Boston? There might be, but Boston has so many young people within five-mile radius. And I always say that it's very likely that you, can, you might meet the next prince of Saudi Arabia on the streets of Boston than in Riyadh itself. The people who walk on the street, man, they're going to change the world, as you know. So would you continue to be praised? How can I be part of this? Number one is to pray. God, would you send the revival back to a nation? So revival is not, the, it's not this you know, event that happens on a Saturday evening or a Sunday morning. Revival happens when people of God desire the presence of God. The beyond everything they desire, they keep desiring for the presence of God. And when, when me and you, when we all continue to desire the presence of God, the King of the universe, He decides to come down to our world. And that is called revival. It's like, Lord, I want, I want your presence. When we all say that, when all of us desire that, Jesus makes His move and comes down. And when He shows up, 
things do happen. We call them revival. So let that happen, right? Let that happen. So we're praying, God, would you bring a revival? Could you create in us a hunger for you? That's where it starts, really, right? Lord, create in my gut a hunger for you that I, that I always sense a need for you, a real hunger for you. Second is that you can be praying that God will open doors in the city of Boston. As you can imagine, there are private schools who do not want people like us near the, anywhere near them. And they would say it is to protect these students because they are private students. You know, they pay so much money. One of our desires is to keep people like you away from them. I was reaching out to one of the campuses, and they, the chief chaplain sent it to me. When a word, may the Lord bless your ministry elsewhere. <laughs> How do you take that for an invitation, right? <laughs> well, thank you. I'll be praying. <laughs> We're praying that God will, uh, God will bring relationships. But I do know that when God opens the door, nobody can shut it. But, but God gives us grace to wait and keep fighting, right? That's what we need. Third is to be asked for, you know, how we can be part in terms of resources. Check with the pastor. pastor will tell you how we can be part of that. Let me jump into the Word. Father, let's pray before that. Father, we thank you that we get to hear from you, Lord. You are a God who speaks to us. Holy Spirit, would you come open our hearts and minds? There is nothing that is hidden for your eyes. So would you speak to us? We need to hear from you. Not the human knowledge and wisdom, but wisdom from heaven. That as we walk out of this place, our hearts are challenged. That we want to go live differently. Help us to do that. Open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I will be reading a few verses from the book of Jonah. We're going to start with Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, and then we will go into chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. So it's going to be a few minutes of reading between my wonderful Indian English accent and ESV translation. If you're not paying attention, you will miss me. So let's go. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, 2, 3. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Jonah chapter 4, verse 1 through 11. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, and it might be a shade over his head, so save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it would hurt. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity in a way the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right hand from the left and also much cattle. The title of the sermon is A Prophet's Journey to God's Heart. There are a few things that we need to 
understand in this particular passage, there are few things here. Jonah, I mentioned quite names and things, so let's look at the pivotal points here. One, Jonah, he's the prophet God is talking to in this particular story. And in a way, it's the place God is sending Jonah on a mission. And Tarshish is the most remote place or destination that Jonah can find to go away from the presence of God. And then there's the plant. God appointed a plant to give Jonah shade because God cared for him. So these are the main things that we're going to work around today. First one, Jonah is running from God's direction. God gives Jonah a very clear direction to go to Nineveh. That's where the people called Assyrians live. He is on a mission. God is on a mission of saving the people of Nineveh or the Assyrians. It says that the, the evil of the people of Nineveh has come up before me. This means God is getting ready to do something about their evil, but God reaches out to his servant, prophet Jonah, and sends him on the mission to get them saved. And the only thing Jonah must do is to preach against their evil so that God can accomplish his mission, that is to save these people. Jonah received the word from God. He understood very clearly the task God gave him. He knew what must he do to accomplish this mission of God. However, instead of being joyfully part of this mission, Jonah began to run away from the task God gave him. He goes to the port and buys a ticket to Tarshish, 2,500 miles opposite to the direction God asked him to go. From where Jonah at the point in Nineveh would have been only 500 miles to the east, but Jonah pays way more to get to the furthest place that he can ever find. See, there is a principle in here. When we disregard God's clear directions in our life, it never remains as a one-time disobedience. Instead, we began to move away from the presence of God and will eventually find ourselves so far from His care. His words are very clear. When we disregard His word, it's just not a one-time disobedience. We started moving to a direction so far from God. It started as a one thing, and then eventually we find ourselves three times or five times far from God asked us to do in the first place. And what happens is that life becomes burdensome. I think about this way. I'm a preacher, so in a, in a, from a preacher's point of view, this is the moment as preachers we wait for. Okay? What is this moment? That God himself shows up and call me, see us. Go to so-and-so place. Preach to them. I'm going to do something. As a preacher, I'm like ready. My goodness, I, I've been waiting for this moment. You know, I'm just trying to make it happen as if God is speaking to me every Sunday. But this is literally God showed up and told me to do something. This is the day. My time has arrived. I am going to make the move. But I always wonder why he wouldn't do that. <laughs> After all, this is the only job he has, right? Prophet John, this is the only job he had. The God would show up. Now, why would Jonah the prophet disregard such an opportunity? Why would Jonah disregard God's clear direction? Why would not Jonah go to Nineveh and preach the message of the repentance? It says that Nineveh was evil. Well, now, we need to understand Nineveh. There are a couple of things that we need to learn about Nineveh. First, Nineveh was the military power of the time. It was a city of war, and its warlike reputation was well earned through its numerous conquests and cruel treatment of those who conquered. Israel lived in threat of Nineveh, and Israel feared them. Israel actually went through the, this cruel treatment of Assyrians. They, were, they tasted that. So Nineveh was the military power. Second, 
Nineveh was known for their fame and wealth. And thirdly, Nineveh was a place of idolatry and sexual perversion. It was famous for its huge library and two temples dedicated to Ishtar, the goddess of war and love. So this is such a messy place. It's a place that, you know, no prophet at the time, it, it seems that Jonah didn't want to go there. And you would wonder why it's the case. In short, Nineveh was a city of evil and well-deserving of God's wrath. And Jonah did not want them to escape the anger of God. Jonah wanted them to pay the price for their evil. Simply said, Jonah hated them. He did not care if the people on Nineveh were all dead. That's a crazy thing for a prophet to think, right? In some sense, Jonah wished if they were all dead. Jonah hated the people of Nineveh. For who were there, Jonah hated the people in Nineveh because of Israel's history with them. Israel was treated so poorly with cruelty by the people of Nineveh. And Jonah himself was a victim of the evil works of the people of Nineveh. And Jonah believed that the people of Nineveh should pay for what they have been doing. In one sentence, Jonah ran away from God's holy direction for the people of Nineveh because he wanted to control the outcome for the people of Nineveh. We run away from God's specific directions to us because we want to control the outcome of our own lives. Don't we all at times sometimes think, I really can't run my life, right? I really can run my life. Thank you, Lord, for your counsel. Thank you, Lord, for the pastor in my life and preachers in my life and my, my small group. But I really do think I can run my life. So this is what Nineveh, Jonah thinks. He ran away from God's specific direction to him because he wanted to control the outcome. Second reason, Jonah was raging angry at God. First, we looked at Jonah running away from God's direction. And second is Jonah's, Jonah is really angry at God. God listens to the cry of the people of Nineveh after Jonah preached to them. God had compassion toward them, seeing the repentance and compassion of God toward them and the fact that God spared them from judgment. Jonah the prophet is now displeased and angry at God. How is that possible, right? Jonah chapter 4, we read this, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, what is that displeased him? The fact that people changed their mind. Or, in other words, they responded to his sermon. <laughs> that, that, that is what he's so angry about. <laughs> It says that, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. What a prayer is that, right? So you kill me because you act are kind toward these undeserving people. Jonah believed in the compassion of God. He must have had experienced that in his own life. He says, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger. Jonah believed God should not have compassion to evildoers and idolaters like the people of Nineveh. He believed that God should have compassion only to certain people. Now we wonder, how can a prophet have such a vision of God's heart? Jonah believed that because the people of Nineveh were not compassionate toward his people, so God should not be compassionate toward them at all. So the first reason for his anger toward God, because God showed compassion to the undeserving group of people. Is it possible for us to be so angry at God to whom we think in our mind that God should never bless them? And they are blessed, now I'm angry. 
So God asked his question to Jonah. Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? And verse 49, it says that Jonah went out to the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under in it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Did you hear that? Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. An angry Jonah goes out to the city, and God appoints a plan to give shade over his head so that he will be comfortable. Let me tell you this. I found myself so much love of God when I read this. Here is, here is a prophet who doesn't understand God's heart, disobeys him, angry at him, but he looks at him and gives him a plant. You understand that? So the plans in our life, the comforts in our life, not because we really deserve them, because He's just such a good God. He just looks at us and He's compassion toward us. He's not giving us based on what we really deserve, but He gives us, looks at them, and He loves us, and then He plans a plan for us. It's crazy, right? That is to understand that. It says that Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Let me tell you, this was the only time in the entire story that he's a happy man. The only time. That's right, Jonah was happy because God provided for his comfort. Then we read, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant and then a scorching east wind. And the next thing we know is that sun beat down on the head of Jonah and he was faint. And this is when he gets angry again. (laughs) Do you do well to be angry, Jonah? He says that, of course, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. It was because God decided to take away the comfort he gave. Jonah, or he thinks God was not compassionate toward him, that he appointed a worm to kill the plant. Right? So second reason Jonah is displeased and angry at God, because God decided to take away the comfort he gave him. The first time he was angry, because God loved a a group of people that he doesn't agree with. And second time he's angry, God took the plant that God planted. (laughs) That's crazy, right? On one side, he's angry at God because God showed compassion toward a people that deserve severe judgment. But on the other side, Jonah, the world deserving of God's compassion feels judged by God when he lost his comfort. It was like God should not have done this and God should have done this. God should not have compassion toward that people because they're evil, but God should have compassion to me and let that plan live so that I can have my comfort. Two reasons for Jonah's anger toward God, but seemingly one big theme. You showed compassion to the undeserving, but you did not show compassion toward me. How about this? God, you blessed those people who are so undeserving, but cursed me who is well deserving. God, you gave them what they don't deserve, but you took from me what I deserve. I remember asking those questions sometimes in my life. Or in one sentence, the theme is this, God, you failed me. You failed my expectations. Jonah the prophet is so angry at God because 
God, you failed me. You failed my expectations. Chapter 4, verse 10 and 11. God said, You pity the plan for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity in a way? The great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the right hand from their left, and also much a cat, cattle. This is amazing. My question is this. Can a prophet still serve as a prophet without knowing the heart of God? Right? He has been receiving the word of God, and he has been a preacher. He has been going and giving messages, and he has been used as a mouthpiece of God. But, but Jonah doesn't seem to understand the heart of God. Maybe he did understand the heart of God. That's why he says, Lord, I know that you are compassionate, God, that you are so kind. But he put his personal feelings beyond the truths of God. See, God is showing Jonah his own heart, or maybe God is giving Jonah a time to repent. <laughs> right? He says to Jonah, you pity the plant that you did not labor, now did you, you did make it grow. Should I not pity these people that I made in my image? Say, my pastor always says that, uh, he always said this, you know, there is something about when your children play together, and you are sitting in the living room, but you can hear them laughing together. Somehow you feel like, wow, my kids are loving one another. <laughs> They're having so much fun. There is something about it, which I can actually say that now. I do. You know, a lot of the time they are like, yeah. It's like fighting each other. But every once in a while, no, majority of the times they are like giggly and funny and laughing. They're like, Faith and I are like, hmm, that's fun to hear that sound. So when God looks at his people, there is no undeserving people, undeserving people. We all are equally undeserving. We all are equally undeserving. It's all his grace. Jonah doesn't seem to understand that. Jonah thinks we are the people of Israel. God, why would you ever be gracious to them like the way you're gracious to me? After all, what they have done to us. Worship team, you can come forward. There's something Jonah understood for the first time. That God's compassion to all people is beyond his personal feelings. Well, your personal feelings are great, but God's compassion is not bound by my personal feelings. God's compassion is based on what? His character that Jonah knew. His compassion is that I am kind, I am gracious, I am loving, I am faithful. So when he looks at a group of people, he looks at everybody and gives all of him to all of his children, both the deserving and the undeserving. That is the heart of God. Jonah was sent on a mission, but he did not really understand the intensity of this mission. My friends, is it really possible for us to walk with God without really knowing His heart? I get scared when I, when I preach about this because I'm a preacher myself. And you know, Is it possible for us to really walk with the Lord? Or say that I walk with God without really, really, really understanding the heart of God. John I did not understand the worth of the people he was sent to preach. Jonah didn't understand the character of God that he was so deeply believe and serve. Jonah only understood the importance of the momentary comfort. He understood very well the importance of the momentary comfort, but not so much the worth of the people that he was sent to speak to or the character of God that he so, so deeply believed and turned to serve. Jonah was out of touch with his surroundings, out of touch with the message that he was sent to preach, and only in touch with his own comfort. But let me tell you a story of a Malden boy 
who grew up to be one of the greatest missionaries and first America had ever sent out. His name is Adoniram Judson. He was born in Malden, Massachusetts, which is about 30 minutes from where I live. In 1812, Adoniram and Anne Judson sailed to the east, initially on track for India. Adoniram and Anne eventually would lay their, down, their life for Burma or modern-day Myanmar. From the beginning, their marriage was centered around God's call on their lives to missions. But both Adoniram and Anne knew God's command to reach the unreached, so they spent their entire lives sharing the gospel to the unreached. Adoniram and Anne Judson went through many hard times in Burma. The poor food, unbearable heat, and widespread disease made their life so difficult. Two of their babies died in the terrible climate. Both Anne and Adoniram were imprisoned during the war with Britain. And that happened because they chose to live a life God asked them to live. And his lovely wife died because of terrible conditions in Burma. Adoniram marries Sarah, his second wife, and they had eight children together. A few years later, in 1845, Sarah, his second wife, died looking for a medical condition. He lost his second wife in the mission field. When Adoniram Judson died in 1850, there were 7,000 baptized believers, 63 Christian congregations, and 163 missionaries in Burma. To this day, there are hundred. To this day, over 150 years later, his Burmese Bible translation is still in use. Adoniram Judson was buried into the watery depths of the Bay of Bengal in India. Adoniram Judson lived the opposite of what Jonah lived. He lived a life in touch with the message, in touch with the people and out of touch with his own comfort. The mission of God starts by knowing what is dear to God's heart. And we live and partake in this mission of God by continuing to fight for what is dear to God's heart. Now, what is dear to God's heart? That is me and you and everybody that you see in Walmart, in your workplace, in your train stations, everywhere you go, God loves them. And that is the dearest thing that God has. Would you please stand with me? In Jonah, we see a man who runs away from God's direction because he had preconceived ideas about a group of people. Although he carried a message of repentance and understood the nature of God, he still had room in his heart to hate a group of people because of such cruel history. He wanted to control the destiny of these people whom he hated. May I ask you in a very personal way, are we running away from God's very clear direction that gave you, that God gave you? Is there anything that you're running away from? God asked you to do this. Maybe you don't want to do it because you want to control the outcome. But God is calling us today to himself this morning. Same words that came to Jonah is coming to us this morning. Arise and go. Go to Jesus. Are you running away from a direction that God gave you personally regarding your workplace? Maybe the people that you saw in the workplace, the person that you know from your family that you have been praying about or praying for a long time. Maybe somebody in the neighborhood, maybe some of somebody. Let me tell you, when God asks you to do something, it's not just send you to do it. When you make the move, He comes around and He walks with you. Isn't it amazing? When God asks you to do something, it is told, they go figure it out, see us. No, when I obey Him and when, when I make the first step, He comes around me and He strengthens me and fills me with the Holy Spirit and He enables you to do that. But the thing is that you got to obey Him first. I've got to make the move so that God can come alongside of me and do His mission. You don't have any mission. It's God's mission, right? 
this morning, Jesus is calling us to a life in touch with the message we carry, a life that reflects the character of God, and out of touch with only our own comfort. Father, we come to you this morning. We long for your presence in our lives, O oh Lord. We thank you that you never hide the weaknesses and the troubles of your children in the scriptures as we can learn from it. But you're interested in showing your heart and inviting people to it. So thank you for showing a heart this morning again. Would you make us a people who care for the people around us because you made them in your image and you died for them. Oh God, would you give us a burden for that? Would you fill in our hearts with the deep desire for it that we will long to live and reflect your nature and character and wherever we go, Lord? Forgive us of seeking our own comfort all the time. We thank you, Lord, for the work that you called us to do. You are so good. Thank you for loving us. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. We love you Let's give the Lord a good hand in this place today. Thank you, Lord. How many of you were just touched by that message that CS brought us? One of my friends coming in the door for this service asked me how the guest speaker did. I said, well, I said, I got to tell you the truth. His message snuck up on me and I found myself feeling a little convicted. My old Bible school president's wife used to say, if the shoe fits, let it pinch. Is that your heart? Lord, forgive me for thinking about my comfort so often and not enough about your compassion for those who need you. May God give us those compassionate hearts. Let's just express our appreciation to CS for that uh, message that he shared with us today. Thank you so much. 
for our final act of worship, we just want to receive uh, an offering for CS and Faith and their family. They are missionaries to the student population in the city of Boston. That means they have to raise their own support. In your program, we put an extra offering envelope and maybe you can just quickly prepare an offering to share with them. I'm gonna ask the ushers that they would just come bring a couple of offering plates down, set them on the floor. I didn't, I didn't warn CS and Faith. Uh, we have a way that we like to take offerings here. Uh, the Bible says in the book of Acts that the people brought their offerings and laid them at the apostles' feet. And so in just a moment, I'm gonna ask CS and Faith to come and stand right here. And I want you to just give us a little elbow room there. Yeah, thanks Robin. Uh, I'm gonna, that's good. I'm gonna ask them to, uh, to come and just stand here. And I want you to bring an offering and just touch them. Uh, shake their hands, give them a fist bump, bless them, give them a, give them a light hug. Um, and you touch them and let them touch you. There's a principle of reciprocity in the New Testament. Jesus told the disciples, go into towns and villages and accept their hospitality and after you receive their hospitality, release the kingdom to them. So when we make a deposit of our hospitality in the ministry of those who are carrying the kingdom, they release to us what they're carrying. So I want you to touch them, let them touch you, bless them. Now listen, don't tell them your life story. They care about your life story. But when we get to heaven, we'll sit down and have coffee. We'll have Indian chai tea and you can tell them your story. But just bless them and leave your offering for our final act of worship. Uh, and then you may be dismissed. The worship team's going to sing us out. Let me just bless you. Father, thank you so much for the people you love so much. Lord, I pray that you'd watch over us. Lord, I pray during this coming week that the cloud of your presence would envelop us. I pray that your protection would surround us. I pray that your provision would accompany us. I pray that your providence would lead us and your peace encircle us until we come together again rejoicing. And everybody said, amen and amen. God bless you, everybody. Bring an offering. Come see us in faith. Come stand here if you would. God be with you. Have a great week.